of how to stay plugged in and connected to God. I would say that in this wise, because of my own personal experience with God, understanding that God is sovereign, He's over everything. That's an important characteristic for us to understand about God. He is a sovereign God. But not only is He sovereign, through His sovereignty we experience providence, which means there's nothing by happenstance that happens in the life of a believer. That's why Romans 8 and 28 begins to give us the foundational justification for that by simply saying, for we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God. So I have this understanding of God in control and God navigating circumstances. And that's good for us to know that as clear as that may be and from a theological perspective. But where our theory moves into praxis is to getting to the place where I understand I will never be able to fully ascertain the sovereignty and providence of God until I mature my faith to simply believe what God says. It's one thing to keep him as an abstract entity that we say he's in control. But yet oftentimes we struggle because God's control is oftentimes out of our control. And because we struggle in trying to navigate things according to our own ways, our own wives, we struggle with the control of God, not understanding if we simply would submit our will to his will, then ultimately everything will work out according to the destiny that has already been prearranged by God. I'm simply suggesting today that those of you who are mature in the faith need to get to the place where you simply stand firm on the foundational premise that you just want to be obedient to the Lord. I say that because I know through all the spiritual disciplines, most of us fail in that genre. We miss opportunities of blessings and favor simply because we do not obey what the Lord says. And part of that challenge is that we struggle because what the Lord says oftentimes does not make sense or line up with what we want manifested in our lives. And so we are so quick to gain the promise without understanding you cannot get the promise without going through the process. God oftentimes takes us through the process in order to mature us, develop us, and also to build a unique connection that's built on trust on the Lord. That's what brings us to our text, which is quite an intriguing passage, and as I stated earlier, was one that I was simply going to skip over. I'll be honest with you, I was moving towards the actual eating of the meal of the Passover, the transition that takes place from the Passover to the Lord's Supper, but yet in my own devotional period, the Holy Spirit screamed to me as if to suggest Goodman do not pass over the preparatory moments that led to Passover. These verses that was led, that was read for you is really just those moments. It's a dialogue that Jesus is having with his disciples as they're trying to figure out where shall they have the Passover meal. And the story begins to read thusly that they come with an inquiry where shall they have the Passover and Jesus gives them some specific instructions that begins to foretell or foretell how and where and when the Passover meal will take place. And I, I began to just find that very powerful to me, not just in the specificity of the instruction, and yes, it's absurd in some of the things Jesus says, I was more caught by the simple fact of how the disciples responded because they had the question, they came to the Lord, and he answered their question. And notice in our text, in verse 16 there is no conversation there's no conference call there is no disagreement they finally do what the Lord says and the Bible simply says that when they stepped out on obedience just what the Lord said is how things got manifested in their journey to once again bring the Passover to manifestation may I submit what I love these disciples they become a paradigm of faith for all of us simply because it causes us to stretch ourselves to the place where we cannot just be followers of Jesus but we must follow through on what Jesus says. Listen, there is a distinct difference because you can follow Jesus and still not follow through on what Jesus says because that's a whole nother issue and for many of us that's the next level of faith, that's the next trust issue. You don't mind following Jesus but Jesus wants to know can you trust me enough to do what I say do and just obey because it is through obedience obedience that you'll get blessed there's somebody that knows Bible that can testify when he says in the Old Testament obedience is better than sacrifice 
And there's some of us that are trying to make this a difficult premonition and you want to come up with every which way. You want to try to figure out how can you maneuver and manipulate God. Simply all I come to tell you is just do what the Lord says. That's our text. That's what I believe is a central theme and thesis that is raised from this text is that it teaches all of us that we're going to experience the next level of blessings and favor in our lives is predicated on one simple premise and that's obeying what the Lord says. I come to tell you uh, that even before you had the question, the Lord already had the answer. That all you're going through is a process to get you to the predetermined promise that God has for you. Maybe some of you in church and you're worrying over the wrong things because what you are worrying about, uh, he's already worked it out. But he wants to know uh, that in spite of your worry, can you trust me enough to walk the process uh, and know that I'm so much God and I care so much about you uh, that I've already prepared something for you. Uh, I just want to know are you willing to do what it takes uh, to get to that place where you can already realize uh, what I've already predestined and preordained uh, for your life. Touch your neighbor and tell him it's just a setup. You you concerned about a job. It's just a setup. You, you concerned about healing. It's just a setup. You wondering what's going to happen with your kids. It's just a setup. You wondering how am I going to make it through this situation. It's just a setup. The Lord has already prepared something for you. He just wants to know, do you have the faith to trust him and obey his word? Touch that neighbor and say, I need this word today. I, I've been struggling in some things. I've been upset over some things. I, I've been in a crisis of my faith. I come to tell you, stop sweating. Stop crying. Stop getting mad. Stop cursing your crisis. Just know that there is nothing by happenstance that happens in your life. God sent me to tell you, it's just a setup. I already know how I'm going to work it out. I just need you to tell how much you trust me and love me enough to follow my word. That's our passage. And I'll be honest with you, from a relative question standpoint, it begins to answer us in this pericope that tells us that we simply know how mature our faith is by learning how to obey God through our perception, our passion, and our participation. In other words, what I'm telling you is that sometimes you've got to be willing to perceive what God says, have passion for what God says, and participate in what God says. Those three entities are critical and they are utmost importance if you're to ever experience what the Lord wants you to experience. Come on y'all, let's get into this passage of scripture. I believe that it's tailored to teach us some very powerful principles and truths today and I want to share it in this alliterative outline. I want to show some things how God in our text had already set up the disciples in order for them to experience a next level blessing. Here it is. First thing I want you to jot down if you don't mind is the first thing how we know it's a setup how we can mature in our faith through obedience is that we first of all got to be comfortable in unusual occurrences in other words sometimes our faith is going to be challenged by the fact that God is going to send us to some absurd situations that's our text. You read it in verse 12. It gives us the chronological timeline for which Mark wants to prepare us to understand what's happening here in our text. And it's clear that it's the Passover season. It is the unleavened moment of the bread. And according to their Deuteronomy understanding, we understand that now the end of one day is the start of the next. This is the time of the Passover where they're commemorating their liberation from Egypt. And so you see now that according to the strict rules of that time, that is clearly as six o'clock hits on the dot the sun goes down one day ends and one day begins so at the time of our text what we see is that things have now happened it is the eve it is the actual day of the Passover and according to their rules and regulations they only had a few hours to consume the Passover meal and normally what would happen groups of about 10 to 15 would come together congregate and share in the Passover meal this makes Jesus and his disciples an ideal group for having the Passover meal together but note in our text in verse 12 the disciples come to Jesus and they have a very and in, uh, in, in they have this amazing inquiry they want to know Jesus where do you want to have the Passover where do we need to get ready the time is upon us so tell us where we're supposed to go now notice first of all uh, the instruction of Jesus he says go into the city now this is crucial because right now they're in Bethlehem 
Bethany. We understand that Bethany is a place of comfort, rest, and refuge for Jesus because of the throngs of people that are in Jerusalem. Bethany becomes their best uh, escape. This becomes their best place for them to be in what you would consider um, this place of being anonymous, if you will. Uh, but yet, Bethany is where they are currently housed. But according to Deuteronomy 16, verse 1 through 8, Passover cannot take place in only place. The only place it can take place is in Jerusalem. So, but they're currently in Bethany. So Jesus tells the disciples, go to the city because this specific assignment that you have to accomplish cannot be accomplished in Bethany. Now, Bethany is a cool place. It's a place of comfort. It's where they've been rolling. It's where they've been chilling. It's where they have friends. But for the sake of the Passover, they could not stay in Bethany. They had to go to the city of Jerusalem, which means that in order for them to complete this assignment, they would have to leave the comfort of Bethany. That the only way they could bring to pass this assignment was they would have to leave Bethany in order to go into Jerusalem. May I submit for my brothers and sisters that that oftentimes is what the Lord requires in order for us to ascertain and fulfill the assignments of our life. Sometimes he pushes us out of our comfort zone. He knows that what we're supposed to do can't take place in Bethany. It has to take place in Jerusalem. And that's why some of us struggle now because we're in this cosmic tug of war with God because we're trying to dictate to God where we will accomplish our assignment. God says no because according to how I have dictated things, there's a specific location that your assignment can be fulfilled. And if that means I need you to leave Bethany to go to Jerusalem, then that's what you need to do. That's why some of us are frustrated in life because you're trying to do something in Bethany, understanding that Bethany was not the place of the Passover. It was in Jerusalem. And God sent me to tell somebody under the sound of my voice that, that you need to stop tripping, stop being frustrated. Just learn how to trust God. Go to the city that God wants you to go to. That's why some of us can testify when you finally listened and heeded God and you went to a place that God sent you up. That's when you started seeing doors opening up. You started seeing windows opening up. You started to see some things that happened and you were wondering how come it took so long. It wasn't that the assignment wasn't ready. Maybe you weren't ready. It wasn't that the timing wasn't right. Maybe it was because you weren't mature enough to separate from some things so that God could send a blessing your way. These two disciples. According to Luke is Peter and John and they're now sent to Jerusalem and watch what Jesus says. He says now your sign when you get there is to follow a man carrying a water pot. Now understand in that patriarchal society this is an unusual absurd occurrence because normally carrying water in a water pot was a woman's job. And so mainly if men were carrying water, it would be in water skins, which was like a lap bag, and they would carry it underneath their arm. But here, Jesus has specificity, and he tells them, listen, when you get there, you're going to come into encounter with a man carrying a water pot. Now, that's going to be strange. That's against societal norms. That's not going to make sense to nobody else. But it's your sign that I'm telling you which way to go. This is my sign sign to you uh, for you to know you're in the right place is when you see something that's strange uh, and doesn't make sense. He says uh, this sign uh, is what is going to alarm you and alert you uh, to that I'm trying to get something moving and that is your sign uh, that is time to follow. See can I tell you that most of us uh, we miss God because we want stuff to be normal but the God I serve is always up to some abnormal stuff. You you want stuff to be natural uh, when God says I do supernatural stuff. I, I produce stuff that doesn't make sense uh, in order to get your attention because uh, if it made sense you think man did it. Uh, but I got to do stuff that don't make sense uh, so that you know it comes uh, from God. Okay you look like you need some Bible. Come here Sarah. She's 90 years old uh, and now she's burdened with a child. Her, her ankles are swelling. She's craving ice creams and pickles and she's 90 years old but it was a response to the fact that she did not trust
trust in the faithfulness of God because God had to check and say is there anything too hard for God and so he allowed a woman to be pregnant at 90 as a strange sign I'm telling you God will do some strange stuff to get your attention okay come here Moses and the children of Israel you're at the Red Sea and now you got rocks on one side and Pharaoh's army beside you or behind you and now you got to figure out how we gonna cross this Red Sea we ain't got no yacht we ain't got no boat we ain't got no life jackets ain't none of us pass no lifeguard class so how we gonna get through this Red Sea and the Lord said something strange lift up your hand Moses and when you lift up your hands waters will part isn't it amazing that when they did the strange thing they walked on dry land across to the other side y'all ain't gonna help the preacher I'm here to tell you God will do some strange stuff come on y'all that's what he did to the children of Israel he decided because they were hungry to give them manna in the morning you know what manna means in the Hebrew it means what is this it was a strange occurrence that blessed the children of Israel they got thirsty God said since I ain't got no water fountains find me a rock Moses speak to the rock and water flew out of the rock okay y'all ain't hearing me here I come to tell you the Lord will do some strange stuff to get your attention he'll confuse the world confound the wise because he does stuff that people are not expecting okay you need one more analogy well come here Jesus here he was he was a son of God but he was not born in the palatial palace of Jerusalem he was not schooled in the rabbinical schools that was under all of the objecture of those there he was born in an inconsequential town he came from a spot it was the hood nobody expected anything to come from where Jesus came from he didn't have a lot of people rolling with him he didn't walk around with swords and spears but he still was the son of God and it was through that inconsequential occurrence of Jesus that we are able to have redemption I come to tell you the Lord will do some strange stuff to get your attention touch your neighbor and say neighbor I know about some strange stuff he, he'll do some weird things to show you how much God he is he'll give you in your older age a desire to go back to school that's a strange occurrence he'll give you with your jacked up credit favor at the car dealership and favor for getting a new house touch your neighbor and said I know something about strange stuff because that becomes your sign that the supernatural is on the way a man carrying a water pot Y'all got to admit, this has got to be a strange occurrence for these disciples. There was specificity in the instructions. He basically was telling them, this is it, and you know it's this when you see it. Now remember, there's a lot of pilgrims, there's throngs of people in Jerusalem. Literally a quarter of a million people have invaded this city, which means people were shoulder to shoulder. This would not be an easy search for the disciples it's just two of them and they got to find one man carrying one water pot and that's their sign about where to go come on that's that's rough that's like looking for a needle in a haystack matter of fact that's like some of us struggling to find where's Waldo you don't remember what Waldo looked like you struggle but notice the specificity in this text he said, that's your sign. Now you can imagine there were many men in the city. There were many pots in the city. But this was a specific combination of what they were to look for as a sign from God. And I must admit, I appreciate their patience because you know for many of us, we would have got weary in well-doing. And we would have settled for any man or for any pot. But Jesus was specific because if you follow the wrong man and follow the wrong pot, you'll end up in the wrong place. Y'all ain't gonna help me, okay. And maybe that's why some of us struggling because you got impatient in the instructive moments and so you settle for any man and settle for any pot without waiting for the Lord to show up like he said. Y'all ain't gonna help me here. And 
Maybe that's why some of you confused and frustrated and jacked up now because you settled. And if you would have just learned how to be patient and wait on the Lord and wait for the Lord to give it to you. I wish I had about 15 of y'all that can testify. Touch that neighbor and say, just wait on it. He, he knows what he's sending your way. Stop trying to be in a rush. Stop trying to be in a hurry. Learn how to wait on what the Lord has said. If I had time, I, I would tell you something. This is what blessed me in the text is the text says the man with the water pot met them. Which means if you wait long enough, you ain't got to search for nothing. It's looking for you. Y'all ain't going to help me here. Sometimes the miracle you're looking for is looking for you. Touch your neighbor and say, just keep holding on for a little while. The blessing you've been expecting, it's been expecting you. Sometimes if you learn how to wait and trust in God, what you're waiting for is coming your way. Touch that neighbor and say, neighbor, don't get weary in well-doing. Just trust in God. Your man with a water pot is going to show up if you learn how to trust the Lord. Oftentimes, we get impatient in the process and say we choose anything, but understand the Lord has specificity in his instruction. It wasn't just any man, just one any pot. It was one man carrying a water pot. You'll know it when you see it, because that's what the Lord said. That's our text. So first thing we know is a setup. You've got to learn how to be comfortable in unusual occurrences. But there's something else here. Because they had to leave and go to the city, follow a man with the water pot. Because here it is in our second principle. I want you to write down. It's a setup. Because then we have to be confident in unveiled openings. This is why it's important you learn how to wait on the sign from God. Because their job was to follow the man with the water pot. Which means I'm going to waste precious time following the wrong thing. That's why if you're praying for anything, pray for discernment. Because I don't want to be wasting my time following after the wrong thing. This is why it's significant because this man with the water pot leads them to a house. They get to the house and they man enters and they meet the owner and when they get there note the questions they raise where's your guest room in other words where's your upper room our teacher said where's his room so him and his disciples can have Passover now this is crucial understand why this is significant because it was Jerusalem during the Passover season which meant that rooms for pilgrims were at a premium can you imagine with the limited accommodations all these people coming in it'll be hard to get a room in Jerusalem imagine master's week you trying to wait to the last minute to get some accommodations you know you do that it's gonna cost your arm leg neck elbow it's gonna cost you it's almost impossible to wait for accommodations so our text says to us but they get there meet the owner and they asked, where's the upper room? Where is the guest chamber? But what they didn't know, and most scholars would suggest, is that Jesus had already prearranged a room for them. So the reason they had to follow the right man with the water pot is he was going to lead them to the right house where the room was already provided. Watch this. Note how they got access to the room. It's going to blow your mind. It's deep. I know. We're about to go into real deep water here. They ask for it. It floored me too. I'm with you. You're shocked at how deep that is. In other words, there was a room that was theirs. But the only way they could get access to it was simply be bold enough to add, y'all, okay. Um, it's theirs. The Lord had already prepared it for them, but they couldn't get it until they were bold enough to open their mouths and add. Okay, see, see, I understand. I know why we struggle. Because unfortunately, in our aim of 
being spiritual, I aim to try to be responsible believers. We try to shy away in totality from what we consider prosperity propaganda. In other words, we sometimes run the gamut without understanding that asking and receiving is a biblical mandate from God. In other words, there are things that God has prepared, but you can't get it until you have the confidence to ask for. See, uh, y'all gonna make me bring out my grandma's theology. Grandma would say it this way, uh, a closed mouth don't get fed. Uh, see, that's why some of you uh, are missing out on some blessings because uh, you too afraid uh, to claim what is already yours. Uh, but I wish I had some honest folk in the house uh, that said, this is the season I'm claiming everything uh, that the Lord has for me. Uh, that means I'm gonna put my mouth on my next miracle. Uh, that means I'm gonna declare my next deliverance. I dare you, if you got enough gumption today, turn to somebody and say, neighbor, you better start claiming uh, what the Lord has for you. If you want it bad enough, uh, you gotta ask for that thing. Uh, and I've got to the place in my own life, uh, I want everything God has for me. Uh, and so I don't mind declaring I need healing. Uh, I don't mind declaring I need salvation. Uh, I need redemption. Uh, I need prosperity. Uh, and so some of you ought to get practical. Uh, start claiming some stuff. Uh, because if the Lord said it, Y'all ain't gonna help me here. That's why I refuse to stay sick because by his stripes I've been healed. So I claim my healing because it's already got my name on it. I refuse to be in poverty because he says my God shall supply all of my needs. I tell you, if you got enough faith today, touch a neighbor, say start naming it and claiming it. Understand what God has for you, it is for you. Is there anybody beside me? that said I'm going to do whatever I got to do I'm going to be bold and confident to claim what the Lord has most of us struggle I understand now here's what's crazy I told you rooms in this time were at a premium which meant surely some other folk came by knocked on the same door and wanted the same room but because it was already reserved Man, y'all gonna make me preach myself out of my suit today. Because it was already claimed, even though they got there first, they couldn't take what was already, y'all ain't gonna help me here. That's why I ain't gotta get mad with nobody. I ain't gotta brown nose nobody. I ain't gotta smooth up to nobody. Because what the Lord has for me. I thought I had some radical ride or die saints in the house to look at your neighbor mean mug them and say neighbor you cool and everything but you can't have what's mine that's why I ain't got to chase after the same thing you can have what's yours and I'm going to have what's mine you do you and I'm going to do me because what the Lord has for me it is That too many of us, when you don't listen to the instruction, when you don't know you have the authority to claim it, when you don't walk in what the Lord says, you don't know what you have ownership to. That's why the devil has punked the people of God, because when you don't read your Bible, you don't know the promises God has for you. But if you ever would get a little courageous and start reading what the Lord says is yours, You'll start walking a little different and talking a little different and tell somebody my swag coming back because I know what the Lord has for me. I ain't tripping. I'm just going to be everything God wants me to be. I told him earlier early when I travel, one of the things that I do, I travel. But oftentimes I struggle because a lot of times I travel, I don't look like a preacher, I guess. You know. They have my little profile pic, the one we send out, I'm all suited and booted. When I travel, I'm in casual wear. I mean, jogging suit, headphones, sad nose, I'm hat to the back, I'm chilling, I'm traveling. <laughs> and so there's been some times in the past, because people were expecting something or someone different, I spent a little more time waiting in the airport, getting picked up. <laughs> so I learned to remedy that. We tell the staff, he said, listen, you may not recognize Dr. Goodman when he comes. But here's what you do. Just stand there with a sign with his name on it. You have something with his name on it. He'll, you ain't got to look for him. 
he'll look for you. Okay, y'all. Which means because it has my name on it, everything that's connected to the driver, y'all ain't gonna help me here. See, that's why sometimes you ought to be on a search mission and say, I just want what's mine. If it got my name on it, then that's what I'm going after. I hear you. I see some of y'all theologies warped a little bit. Some of y'all challenged. I see some of you cringing. Uh, some of y'all sanctified spooky saints. I hear you. <laughs> My pastor, I don't know how I feel about that. You, you that name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. That prosperity stuff. Come on, pull it down. No, well, understand why they could name it. Because the text says, when they went, they said, My teacher wants his room for him and his disciple. Okay, y'all missed it. You know why I can claim it? Because I know if it's his, it's mine. Y'all ain't gonna help me here. See, see, sometimes we fail to, um, to underestimate. Now, we fail to appreciate what kind of God we serve. Some of us think uh, we serve a little, small, minuscule God. Can I remind you how great our God is? Matter of fact, Scripture says uh, he has cattle on a thousand hills. Uh, okay, that didn't shout nobody. Maybe you shout over this. It says in the word of God, the earth is the Lord's. And the foot. So why am I tripping? Why, why am I equating my God to something small? Do you know everything belongs to him? And since I'm connected to him, I got access to what he has. Y'all ain't gonna help me here. But bump that neighbor beside you and say, neighbor, you know who you connected to? You know what kind of God you serve? If it's his, it's yours. Because that's how it works in connection. Come here. Come Shut up comfortable and unusual occurrences you're going to see some strange stuff as a sign but you also got to be confident in unveiled openings it's yours we'll be bold enough to ask for yeah, yeah. here it is the final thing i'm going to share is that here it's a setup because i have to be committed in unfinished opportunities now, this is where it gets deep for me because owner takes them to the guest room or the upper room these were rooms that would literally be either adjacent to the house or in the context of this particular narrative is on top of the house. But you couldn't have access to it through the house. You had to have access to an outside stairway. But Mark, I love Mark because he gives us a lot of detailed information. He does not just call it a guest chamber or upper room. He talks about what is in the room. And when they get there, Peter and John See a furnished room. Oh my God. It's not bare. Yeah. It's not empty. Thank you, Lord. It's already been set up yeah. for them when they get there. They, yeah. they don't have to buy furniture. Yeah. Ain't got to get no curtains. Yeah. Ain't ordering no appliances. Yeah. When they get to the room, it's ready to be used. Yeah. Yeah. However, there's still something left. Yeah. They've got to prepare the Passover meal. Come on now. Okay, I hear you. It, you got excited over the furnished room. I'm with you. <laughs> I ain't got to go to Ikea. I ain't got to go try to get no furniture. No, that was already in there. Couches, lounges, the pillows. Everything was needed. Everything they needed to recline and rest in the room was there. However, there still was something for them to do. Because the room was not created to just be a room to view. The room was used to be a place where they serve Passover meal. But Jesus just supplies the room. Now it's up to them to provide the meal. Okay, let me see why we look slow. I understand, I've said this on many occasions. This literally speaks to John Calvin's theology when he talks about divine sovereignty, but human responsibility. John Calvin says that there are things that God does, uh, that he does as his way of showing us purpose and showing us his promise. But he still wants us to do something uh, that corresponds and helps out with the process. That there's things that God does, uh, but there's things that we have to do uh, in order to magnify 
and to once again allow the miracle to be manifested. One of the great biblical stories that outlines that uh, is the death of Lazarus when Jesus is at the tomb. Literally, Jesus says, I can raise Lazarus from the dead, but you got to roll away the stone. You uh, have got to take off the grave clothes. There's stuff that I can do, uh, but understand there's stuff you got to do uh, to partner in the miracle. See, I see why some of us still are asleep. Well, let me put it this way. Uh, in other words, Jesus saying, uh, I'm giving you the opportunity, uh, but you have got to work it uh, to get the best out of the opportunity. Uh, I provided a room, uh, but you got to provide the resources, okay? Uh, some of y'all needed to be clear, okay? Uh, I'll give you the job, uh, but you got to show up on time. Uh, you got to do your work. Uh, you got to be a model person uh, because just because you got the job uh, don't mean that this needs to stop right there, okay? Uh, I'll give you the relationship, uh, but I need you to honor, cherish, respect, love, uh, obey, submit to your person that you connected to uh, because I I'll give you what you want, but I need to know how bad are you willing to work it out. Okay, I'll give you the healing, but I need you to adhere to a good diet. I need you to follow your doctor's instructions. There's things that I'm going to do, but it's going to be an unfinished product. I need to know, are you willing to work the miracle in order to produce the desired effect? I wish I had some more folk that would help the preacher, because I wonder how many of us walked into some furnished rooms but still mismanaged the miracle and so you prayed and you cried but as soon as God gave it to you you thought that was it and God sent me to tell you that's not how I operate I bless you with it but you gotta work it till it comes to pass I give you the desires of your heart but you need to learn how to put in your best to make that room a place that we can sacrifice I wish I had about 17 of y'all in the house touch that neighbor left right front back and said work it baby work it he gonna give you the access to the room but are you willing to work it so that you can get the best out of what God gave it to you he said I'll give you the scholarship to school but you need to show up to class do your work and watch how God blesses I wish I had somebody beside the preacher that gets excited because you realize that what God has given you is in your hands for you to do something with it I hear you. I see why we struggle. Because many of us, we don't like the process of maintenance in our miracle. Yeah. But we want the Lord to do everything. That's why I tell people, be careful what you ask for. Because you don't know the work that it takes to be there. Remind me as a kid, as a kid, all I wanted was a pet. Finally, they relented, acquiesced to my request, gave me a dog. I was happy. This little mutt dog I had, it was the greatest dog in the world to me. Until I had to figure out they wanted me to feed the dog. <laughs> had to water the dog. Walk the dog. I, I thought that if I just get the dog, that'd be it. I didn't know there'd be work, y'all. Okay. Come on, in in order for me to to keep and maintain the dog, and most of us, that's our challenge. The Lord blesses us, but we can't handle the blessing. So, what was the process? They had to with this unfinished opportunity. Well, they had to prepare the area for the passive. Now, there were certain things according to Exodus that they had to do. First thing they had to do was clear or search for leaven in the home. Because according to Exodus, leaven, which was the ingredient that made dough rise, if you look at it from a scriptural standpoint, represents corruption and evil. Because they were in a rush from their liberation of Egypt, they saw leaven as a deterrent or something to delay them from their liberation. So they commemorate this Passover by searching the house to make sure there's no leaven in the room because leaven could contaminate the meal. So to prepare for the blessing, they had to make sure there was no evil or corruption in the room because where they were getting ready to go, they didn't need anything contaminating it 
when the Lord showed up. Okay, okay. May, may I submit that sometimes the best way to prepare and get your blessing right is learn how to clean house. That maybe you need to get rid of some stuff that may be in the room that has the potential to contaminate what the Lord is about. Okay, y'all missing it. Oh, sometimes the best thing you can do uh, before you bring anything in, uh, maybe you need to kick some stuff out. Before you decide uh, to prepare the meal, uh, learn how to clean house and get the evil out of the room. Okay. So they had to release the leaven, but then uh, they then had to go get the Passover lamb. Remember, uh, this was a thing that everyone had to do. Can you imagine uh, these quarter of a million people all going uh, to get their own uh, Passover lamb? And so Peter and John had to go and get their lamb. And there was a specific place in Jerusalem uh, they had to go. They had to get not sheep, not goat, but an unblemished uh, lamb. And when they got the lamb, there was only one place that they could have the lamb prepared uh, to be sacrifice they had to wait in line at the temple because at the temple as soon as they got to the front the priest would take a knife slit the throat of the lamb the blood would come on a bowl they would dash the blood on the altar as a sign of the Passover and these they would take this uh, unfiltered lamb take it back to the house and roast it in totality at the crib in other words for them to get the lamb it was gonna be a process it was not something that was gonna be quick it was gonna be something that was gonna take time and strategy. You, you just couldn't find any lamb. It had to be the right lamb and you couldn't have anybody slit his throat. It had to be a priest. And you had to make sure it was right according to what the Lord had said. And I wondered why did these disciples make sure and did such immaculate work in preparing this Passover meal? And maybe it's because the text tells us in verse 16 that they knew Jesus was coming to the room. I wonder how would our work ethic be if we acted as if the Lord was coming into the room that he's blessed us with. How would you work if you treated as if the Lord was going to show up? How would your home life be if you treated it as if the Lord was going to show up? Some of us need to act in our lives as if the Lord is about to show up. Do I got anybody beside the preacher that said that's how I ought to act. That ought to be the action I live by. I want to make sure that the Lord is pleased with my process because what I'm doing now doesn't just bless me but it also glorifies him I'm going may the Lord bless you real good fall down and one more to go but there's something else in our text that intrigued me because I began to realize in some scholars they said this room that they furnished the room that they had the Passover meal had some other significance in scripture yes some scholars suggested that this was the home of the parents of John Mark. John Mark was a contemporary of Peter. He in essence is the author of the Gospel of Mark. And I wondered why is that so significant? Why is it significant of this upper room that they use in Mark chapter 14? Until I realized that when you read a little bit further that this was not the only time that this room would be utilized. Turn on to Acts 1 and Acts 2. It tells us that after Jesus had been resurrected and came back with them for 40 days that 10 days later it was the day of Pentecost and the Bible says they all congregated themselves on one accord in the upper room this was the same room in Mark chapter 14 that the disciples had Hey, the same room that they experienced in Mark chapter 14 is where they experienced Pentecost in Acts 1 and 2. What you're saying preacher, because you do know it's Pentecost Sunday, which literally means this room that was first found by faith and obedience is the same place that the Holy Spirit descended, that their yes in Mark chapter 14 led to power in Acts chapter 2. That's all I came to tell you uh, that when you give the Lord a yes uh, and when you're faithful enough to obey uh, God says you ain't just blessing your today uh, no 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 uh, but you're gonna bless your tomorrow uh, because a yes today uh, 
can lead to power tomorrow. That if you learn how to obey and trust the Lord and take him at his word, this ain't the only way this area is going to be utilized. Because of your faithfulness today, you're going to usher in something else on your tomorrow. I'm going to make the Lord bless you real good, but I need some faithful folk in the house. Now, this is not for everybody because everybody is not going to have the faith to obey. So I'm not going to cast aspersions. You cool. Just keep doing what you're doing. Enjoy your ribs and potato salad tomorrow. But I need some folk that's still in the sanctuary right now that can declare, I want to tell the Lord yes. I will admit, Pastor, it's been some trying moments. I didn't always understand what God was doing. But I learned to trust him because I've learned that when he asked him a question, he's already had the answer. That I serve a God that needs nothing to happen stance. That he's already ordered my steps in my way. And if I would just have the faith to simply tell him yes, then I can experience the Lord at a new level in my life. I got a little, may the Lord bless you real good. But I feel like preaching here now. And I need some help closing this message. Turn to somebody close to you if you don't mind. I know you've been talking to him for a little while. But turn to him if you don't mind. And grab him by the hand. And say, neighbor, I came to tell you that if you really want to show how much faith you got in the Lord, it's not based on how much you can run and shout. But it's predicated on how much you can obey. That if you learn how to trust the Lord and do what the Lord says that he is able to do stuff that he's already prearranged in your life I came to tell somebody that if you just learn how to tell the Lord yes that one yes from God one yes to a miracle that one yes to trust in him will put you on the pathway to the promise he has in your life so I gotta bid you adieu may the Lord bless you real good but I need some ride of thy saints that said I'm gonna tell the Lord yes I'm gonna say yes Lord yes to your will yes to your way I'm going to trust you, Lord. If you need somebody to go, I'll be like Isaiah. Send me. Do I got anybody here that said, I'm going to go where the Lord wants me to go? If that's your testimony, then help me close a message and open your mouth and tell the Lord, yes. Say, yes, Lord. Whatever you want me to do. Yes, Lord. Where you want me to go. Yes, Lord. Whatever the sign is, I'm going to trust you because I realize it's already a setup. Bye-bye, church. But is there anybody here that says, I trust the Lord. He's made a way before and I believe that he'll do it again. I trust the Lord because he's never, ever, ever failed me yet. Do I got anybody beside the preacher that said I'm going to trust him because that's the kind of God I serve if that's your testimony open your mouth and tell the Lord yes say I'll follow yes because I believe that it's already done goodbye church but I need somebody here to give the Lord it's an already done praise in here if you know that you know that you know that you know that he will make a way I dare you to give him praise I dare you to give him honor I tell you to tell the Lord yes tell the Lord thank you cause there's nobody like my God if that's you I came to tell you just keep trusting keep trying keep believing it's already done open your mouth and give them praise say yeah I know that can't nobody to me like the Lord can't nobody to me like Jesus say yeah 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 I 
don't hear nobody saying nothing. I don't hear nobody praying. Touch that neighbor, say yes. Tell them you're one yes away. You're one yes away. You're one step away. You're one belief away. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. skip over verse 16 please then they saw exactly what he said was gonna happen see here's the problem you waiting on God to move God sent me to tell you he waiting on you to move Because some things will never manifest themselves until you engage the process of walking what he said. See, the problem with us is we want to see, then move. Text says, they moved. Then saw. That, that's why I love y'all. Y'all, y'all love the Bible. Y'all, you say, but well, Pastor, I need some Bible for that. We walk by faith. Not by sight. Listen, stand together. Listen. I need you to hear me. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm telling you, I was gonna skip this whole passage. I was, I really was. God said, no, 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 good. No, 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 no. Because I got some folk that need to hear. How to get to the place of their promise. He said. And many folk are stagnant and stuck. Because you find the instructions in Bethany watch this I wish y'all catch this man I feel this thing right here he told him in Bethany what to do but the miracle the room wasn't prepared till they got to Jerusalem sometimes you get the word in Bethany but you'll get the blessing Sometimes those are not synonymous places. So he'll allow one season for impartation and another season for manifestation. So he wants to know, can you trust me in the process? I wonder, everyone stand, I wonder, what, why would Peter and John, he only said two, I've always wondered this. And when I hadn't said this all day, it, it, it's been on my spirit, I just hadn't said it. What, why would he send those two? Well, if you study this passage, you'll see it's a direct correlation to Mark chapter 11. When he sent two to untie a bound up coat to prepare him for his triumphant entry. Maybe the reason why they didn't have no questions in Mark 14, because they already knew based on Mark 11, that if I just do, see that's why some of y'all, y'all, y'all trip me out. You've been through a Mark 11, and he proved himself there. So why 
why you tripping in Mark 14. Come on, y'all. You act like the Lord ain't never did it before. How you get to where you are? It wasn't because you so smart. He made a way before. And I'm silly enough to believe he can make it. Listen, doors, doors open. I got to go. Listen, stay. Doors open. Come on.